So good afternoon. Thanks again for being here in this conference and making it very successful. Let's move on to this novel approach for diabetes control. You know, we've been getting a lot of drugs in our armamentorium to treat, approach diabetes in different ways. And today we are talking about the glimmin, which is a newer <coughs> class of molecules, which is supposed to have a, a basic pathophysiological defect correction through their novel mechanism of action. Just to say the background, Type 2 diabetes starts at anger, we have complications at anger, one out of three patients <coughs> in our country have CBD and 36% only have got a good control in spite of all these uh, uh, class of drugs which we have and we know CAD accounts for about 80% of deaths and 75% of all hospitalization in diabetic subjects. Timer is not changed, huh? timer has to change. So diabetes definitely remains a huge risk for most of our patients and as you can see this is another study which shows that the micro and macrovascular complications appear very early in our uh, country. And this talks about diabetes related complications which again appear quite early whether it's hypertension related, kidney disease, dyslipidemia, nerve disease and this is a progressive disease which in spite of your basic drug metformin and others it is not still well controlled. And this is an interesting subgroups classification which is done in the euro was translated to our country and it was found that the severe insulin deficient diabetes you can see you can see the severe insulin deficient deficient diabetes there which when you extrapolate this data of course we are also doing a lot of a lot of data is being done now of late about these types of subtypes of insulin and the severe insulin dependent that is something which is there and these were described in the Europeans earlier. So the beta cell dysfunction is the key defect with reduced glucose reuptake at the liver and increased hepatic gluconeogenesis is something which is the basic and these are the reasoning why the metabolic derailments happens and eventually results in systemic hyperglycemia. You can see that the increased lipolysis and increased insulin resistance at the level of pancreas is the one which happens eventually in most of our patients. And hyperglycemia and mitochondrial dysfunction. So this is what is the new concept now that the mitochondrial dysfunction and the basic irregularities need to be corrected. And this dysfunction can be either due to genetic or environmental factors both and eventually there is an inappropriate fuel substrate utilization. I'll just explain that. And as you can see here, you know, at the heart of the matter, the mitochondria is the kitchen of your body, which fires the metabolic reactions in the body. And this is all well explained. I think biochemistry, we need to just uh, uh, replenish in our memories that the ATP or the electronic transport chain or the complexes, what we call this beta cell or the smooth muscle activities depends on whether you are fasting or in a fed state and the mitochondria has got a capacity to switch between these two and when this switch defect happens either due to obesity or insulin resistance or when there is a pro-inflammatory markers because of your obesity the metabolic syndrome then this gets off and that's how it eventually results in metabolic syndrome. So this is what I was talking about the underutilized nutrient substrate where in a healthy diet, you can see on the left hand side, the glucose and fats, oxidates, pyruvate and acetyl coa that enters your TCA cycle and the mitochondrial transport complexes 3 and 5 mediates the insulin sensitivity and the insulin resistance. That means it increases the insulin sensitivity, reduces the insulin resistance, preventing the complications. Whereas this gets in diabetes or obesity, gets affected and that is where you result in increased oxidation increased the TCA cycle gets stimulated and you have the mitochondrial transported defect that is your <coughs> complexes, uh, transport complexes and it eventually results in the rage, the, all the other inflammatory markers. So the nutrient overfeeding or underutilization eventually results in mitochondrial dysfunction. That is the new theory and this is the triad or, or which, which is around this mitochondrial dysfunction. So this hemiclimin is a mitochondrial re-energizer which is supposed to correct this. This is the innovator molecule, the brand name you can see there. It's approved in Japan and in China. 
in about two years and this is the first Glevin's class molecule. Now what are these? Let us look at the hemiglin as a molecule. It very clearly mimics the mitochondria and the, the metformin and except that there is a two additional C atoms with a cyclopentane ring and thus it suggests that the complementary unique cellular targets of mitochondrial respiratory chains and the redox factor synthesis which we just saw the basic defect and it tries to correct that. So it's a first in the class molecule which is recognized by WHO. It was researched in 2007 and it's a unique mechanism of action targets basically the impaired glucose uptake by muscle tissue, the excess hepatic glucose neogenesis and increased beta cell apoptosis. It is supposed to tackle all these three and of course it's been studied in various randomized clinical trials. So it modulates these mitochondrial complexes, the 2 and 3 and eventually results in 5 which is helpful. So this is the proposed mechanism where the red arrows indicate changes in the levels or activity observed in experimental models. And hemoglobin, as you can see, it increases the complex 3 and increases the redox factor and thus, you saw this earlier slide in diabetics and obese patients, it reverses this and reduces this compensatory hepatic glucose output and thus it is supposed to reverse and reduce this pyruvate cycle which is stimulated in that fed state and supposed to reverse these basic defects reducing the pro-inflammatory markers. So as I said, it is a mitochondrial re-energizer where it increases the beta cell function, reduces the hepatic gluconeogenesis, increases the glucose reuptake at the liver level and all these three basic defects it is supposed to correct. It. So this is again what we are showing beyond the glycemic control, the pleiotrophic effects apart from at your pancreatic level. And also it is supposed to improve this cert. That is a pathological stimuli which predisposes to the sudden cardiac death where this NAD depletion will happen and it will be supposed to replenish this, we will not get into this mechanism for want of time now. So eventually it increases the ATP, AMPK and the cert to modulate early control of this mitochondrial dysfunction. Now this is an interesting slide where we are showing the mechanical action of this hemoglobin complements DPP4 and SGLT2 inhibitors. You can see hemoglobin on this first one where beta cell at the skeletal muscle level, the cardiac energetic, insulin secretion, inhibition of hepatic gluconeogenesis, insulin sensitivity and it complements some of these actions which these class of drugs cannot act on. So what are the pleiotropic benefits? I am showing some evidences, short and long term administration of hemoglobin counters, cardiorenal dysfunction in the rat modules, mitochondrial targeted drugs for DKD where it showed the favorable safety profile in CKD 3B and stage 4 and there was no serious adverse events. Another study, hemoglobin prevents heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, FPEV, Recovering with impaired unfolded protein response in mice subject in cardiometabolic stress where it reduced the body weight, visceral fat and improved glucose tolerance and systemic inflammatory response and that's the basic pathological defect it tries to correct. It also optimizes glycemic control in the OAD responsive cases and that's the evidence to assess the efficacy and safety of hemoglobin monotherapy compared to the placebo for 24 hours. And it's a Japanese study where the primary efficacy endpoint was changed in the A1C level from baseline to week 24. Secondary endpoints usual including the OMA to study your insulin resistance. And these are all the evidences of phase 2B for want of time, we are not discussing this. You can see 500 mg, 1000 mg, 1500 mg all were studied and eventually this is the time studies which talks about the phase 3 studies of RCTs, 1000 mg, twice a day, 24 weeks and you can see the number of subjects in each study, they are called time studies. And this is the open label parallel group trial that assesses the long term safety and efficacy of hemoglobin in Japanese patients, one year long study clearly showed A1C reduction from baseline ranging from 0.5 to 0.9 percent and that's something as an add on to all our class of drugs which are available. So it's supposed to be an add on good molecule whenever you are looking for some alternatives in your treatment. Major metabolic added effects that is pleiotrophic effects. The better insulin release in both phases of insulin, so it tries to correct both phase 1 and phase 2 of your insulin secretion.
protects beta cell better than exenatide, shows cardio and renal benefits in preclinical rat modules, and 500,000 mg tablets, currently I think only 500 is available for the treatment of diabetes, as monotherapy, as an add-on, at whatever level you think you can look into. There is a complementary A1C reductions, when it's monotherapy up to 0.9%, add-on to metformin, you can see 0.6, Sita, SGLT2 insulin, it's about, so 0.6%, average it can it can also reduce the pro insulin thus increases the insulin levels and improvement in the 24 hours glucose profiles there are studies for want of time I'm skipping that so to have uh, highlights about this molecule it's a first in class glimmer with unique site of action it improves the respiratory chain complexes and redox factor which eventually impacts the insulin sensitivity and secretion modulates correct the or corrects the beta cell function hepatic gluconeogens and glu glucose reuptake there are eight RCTs involving about 1,600 cases, which has clearly shown the efficaciousness of this. And it's safe and tolerated with the negligible GI or hypoglycemia issues, unlike metformin. Thank you very much for the patient here.